y'all hear me? Okay, I'm going to start today's talk with a confession. I need some affirmation in order to start my show. I will make you a deal. If you give me show energy, I will give you a show, okay? So I am going to reintroduce myself, and I'm going to give us another chance at this, okay? All right, let's do it, let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, your final speaker for NASA's 2023 Business and Finance Forum, please give this round of applause for your John Mathai. For those who don't know me, my name is John Madai. I am a magician and a stand-up comedian and a financial management accountant. <laughs> and it is so good to be speaking in front of live NASA human faces and not Microsoft Teams profile pictures that have not been updated in four years. You know who you are. I think whenever you speak in front of others, you should always give others a little window into who you are. And when I think about what story I have to give you all a window into who I am, I think of Michael Jordan. Don't laugh, I'm not comparing myself to the greatest. But how he often cited the lifelong motivation he received from getting cut from his high school varsity basketball team. And I thought to myself, did I ever have such a career-defining moment in my life? And I do. Uh, true story, I was a very sickly child, severely asthmatic, a lot of allergy issues, just a lot of health problems. And my Uncle John, who's an ear, nose, throat doctor, after seeing my countless ear infections, said to my mom, well, the boy will never be an astronaut for NASA. <laughs> Words a young boy probably doesn't want to hear. And that was my MJ moment. And I turned to my mom, dad, uncle, and auntie, and I said, well, I'll show you 30 years from now, it'll be me reconciling NASA's general ledger 1010 <laughs> fund balance with treasury, identifying all differences by treasury account symbol, ensuring all results are documented accurately, and all corresponding adjusting entries result in NASA's full compliance with GTAS edit number one. <laughs> I didn't say any of that, <laughs> and I wasn't disappointed. Being an accountant was the dream from day one for a sickly child like me. It, uh, it was simply affirmed on that day, and the fact that I can do it for the National Aeronautics Space Administration is simply the cherry on top. It brings me joyfully here for you today. Right. Yep. Oh. But let me actually introduce myself a little more. I, I uh, have a few roles. I work for headquarters OCFO, um, I don't know if I should share this, but I'm also Frank Peterson's mentor. And um, I don't know if that's going to uh, boost my credibility or not. Uh, we meet every few weeks in the lunchroom uh, for a meeting to talk about how Frank's doing. And after, at the end of every meeting, uh, Frank asks me how he's doing. And I say, I think we're going to need a few more sessions, Frank. <laughs> I'm also in emojis. Thank you. Yeah. I'll tell the jokes around here. So, OK. <laughs> Uh, I'm also, no, I, I got this, Frank, I got this, I got this, okay, we're good, we're good, yeah. Uh, I'm also an uh, instructor for CFO University. I teach a couple courses, one accounting course from the balance sheet to the moon, accounting for NASA's property, plant, and equipment. It's a week-long class. I'm pretty sure it's the most in-depth accounting course we offer in CFOU. Would love to have anybody there. I also teach a class called um, professional financial speaking and presenting skills, in which I talk about the art of speaking and communicating in the workplace. Um, would love to have anybody take that class as well. And I've realized that I've been teaching um, and speaking in so many events like this. Uh, I realized that I've spoken at so many events uh, because a couple of months ago, I was at the Atlanta airport coming back from visiting my twin brother, and I was in the security line and somebody walked up to me that I've never met, seen before and says to me, excuse me, are you John Mathai? And I very nervously responded, yes, I am. I'm not carrying any liquids, propellants, or firearms. <laughs> and she introduced herself as an accountant for Stennis Space Center who saw me virtually speak at the BFF last year. Um, Lynn uh, from Stennis, can you raise your hand, Lynn? Yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. It's funny how 
connection can form at events like this, sometimes during the event or sometimes in the security line at an airport six months later. <laughs> so uh, if anyone here didn't believe me in the last month when I told them it's getting so hard to do my job at NASA, I can't even leave my house, people are stopping me on the streets, <laughs> go talk to Lynn. But what ultimately qualifies to speak for you at the Business and Finance Forum is I asked Joe McIntyre if I could, and he said, okay, John, maybe if we have time at the way end. So <laughs> here I am. Uh, but because a lot of my thoughts on the topic of communicating come from my side hustle career as a professional magician, I thought I would do some magic for you. Do you all want to see some magic? Yeah. All right, okay, that's the right answer. So I asked my friends Nick and Melissa to join me on stage. Can we give a round of applause for Nick and Melissa? I see Nick, I see Melissa. Okay, perfect. I am gonna have each of you sit down uh, at either seat. So I have a secret talent. I'm gonna demonstrate a secret talent that I don't think anybody here knows about. Um, has anybody ever been to a carnival and you see somebody who can perfectly guess people's heights and weights. Yes. Yes. I can do that. Relax, I'm just gonna guess people's heights, okay? <laughs> so just everybody settle down, okay. So I'm, I'm gonna perfectly guess uh, Nick and Melissa's heights today, um, but I'm gonna do it in I think a little bit of an interesting way, okay? So um, here's the deal. Um, doing good, Nick? Yeah. Okay, I'm, in a moment I am gonna ask you to cut off any number of cards and sit on them, okay? Can you do that? I can do that. Okay, so I'm gonna look away. Can you cut off any number of cards? Um, you good? Yeah. You got it? Yeah. Okay. Um, Melissa, I'm gonna ask you to do the same. Okay, so he just cut some cards. I'm gonna ask you to do some, the same, so I'm gonna look away. Okay, and can you sit on them? Okay, um, Okay, um, Nick, I've, I've known you for a long time. Um, yeah, we've known each other for a long time. We go way back. I know exactly how tall you are, but you look exactly 14 cards taller than you did when you walked on stage. You look exactly 14 cards taller. What do y'all think? Yeah. What do y'all think? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Bring them out. Count them out. Count them in my hand. Everybody out loud. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Exactly. Fourteen cards. How well do I know this man? Exactly. Fourteen cards taller. Let me ask you a question, Nick. How many cards taller did you feel? I, I'm just still trying to figure out how you got fourteen. Okay, okay, okay. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, sit back down on them. Sit back down on them. Okay, uh, Melissa, I've known you longer than I've known Nick. Um, so you look, oh man, this is a little bit harder. Uh, you look exactly 11 cards taller than you did a minute ago. Okay. Count them out. What do y'all think? Okay, I'm only batting a thousand here, so you look 11 cards taller. One. Exactly 11 cards, wow. And these people act like they see this every day. So, okay, can you uh, sit back down on them? Can you sit back down? Okay, that's perfect. Okay, now here's the thing. If I was going to be performing at a carnival, uh, I wouldn't be messing around guessing people's heights and weights. I'd probably be doing magic, right? Okay, so watch, watch what I try and do here. Other than me touching your shoulder, did you feel anything else? No. no. Did either of you feel me touch your butt? <laughs> okay, okay, good, okay, okay. I just made three cards disappear from under Nick and magically appear under Melissa, just like that. Do y'all believe me? Yeah. Somebody says no way. Okay, well that's, okay, okay. You had how many, 14 cards? 14 cards. Count them out, count them out on my hand. You had 14 cards. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
Oh wow, 11 <laughs> cards, exactly 11 cards. Wow. So if he lost three, where do you think they went? Melissa, did you feel anything? No. You did not. No. You're not just saying that because you're my friend. No. Okay, count them out. You had how many, 11? I did, yeah. Okay. Go. One. Thirteen. Fourteen. Wow. A perfect carnival show. Please give a round of applause to my friends Nick and Melissa as you go down the stage. Yeah, you can think about that one for the rest of today. So you will? Okay. 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 Thank you so much. So in order to transition into today's topic, I have to give a quick recap of the last time I was standing here at the BFF. As a performer, such as when I do magic, I always plan my show and I sometimes presume what the best material of my show will be. And oftentimes, I have learned that the audience will tell me what my best material is. And more often than not, it is different than what I originally planned. And I've learned accordingly to just listen to my audience. So last year, I spoke at this event. I offered 30 or 40 minutes of differing things of communicating in the workplace. But there was one thing that I said specifically as it relates to responding to questions that I heard said back to me over 100 times since then. Does anybody remember what that phrase was? Glad to know we're all paying attention here. OK. Uh, uh, Frank, Frank, Frank said it yesterday. What was it, Frank? The phrase? Yeah, the phrase. No, okay, Frank, we're done here. That's, that was on me for calling on Frank. Okay. Uh, th yeah, Kimberly got it. Thanks for the question. Let me tell you what I know. And I asked several people since then, several people that I respect, why, do they th why, did, why did that phrase get remembered in a 30 to 40 minute talk? And the general consensus was it was simple, it was relatable, and it, se it came across as being genuinely helpful. And so I thought today's talk, I would pull on that string a little bit more, and I would offer uh, just some more helpful phrases that I try to use when communicating. And I'm going to call today's talk the magic words. And then I'm going to get out of here, and we're going to take a tour of NASA. Does that sound good? Yep. All right. OK, let's get started. I, I like to consider myself a storyteller. And I thought I would segue into this talk by telling a quick story about magic words, human connection, in the mission of NASA. There was a screening of a short film last year at NASA headquarters called One Small Visit, which at the time was under consideration for an Academy Award nomination for short films. Hopefully some of you were able to see it or some of you have heard of it. It was a true story about a young Indian immigrant family who happened to be traveling through the tiny Midwest hometown of Neil Armstrong in the wake of the 1969 moon landing and the civil rights movement. In the film, they were eating at a local diner. Somebody said to them that the Armstrong family just lived down the street. And they thought it would just be appropriate because of their cultural norms, which happened to be my cultural norms, to just stop by the house, knock on the door, and simply introduce themselves to the Armstrong family and say hi, which they did. And ultimately, this film was simply just about this unexpected and kind encounter that this newly immigrated family had with the family of the first American who went to the moon. Uh, this was the actual photo taken from their visit. That's Neil Armstrong's parents on the left. They're holding the visiting family's baby. I, uh, Neil Armstrong is not in the photo because he was the one taking the photo. I guess you could send a man to the moon, but you could not invent his selfie stick. <laughs> The film was short and sweet. I just found it to be a neat story about human connection. But I also found it to be a good illustration of the power of the mission of NASA and how it inherently brings people together. I do not think a story would be put on the screen if a family, if, if a immigrant family met the family of another famous government official. But meeting the family of the first American to go to the moon, that's just a big deal. And a lesson I want to offer from that is I think some people think you need to have some special speaking ability in order to connect with others with your stories or with your words. And I think the reality is uh, a story like One Small Visit reminds us that using our words to build connection simply starts with a, hi, my name is John. Just wanted to say hi and meet you. Those are the magic words. Now, I personally feel like I have a lot in common with the story of One Small Visit. 
First, I believe in the idea of having in-person conversations with whoever you're around, whether at work or somewhere else, simply saying hi and introducing yourself. Second, I am the son of Indian immigrant parents who passed on to me a love of being an American and the excitement over the mission of NASA and going to the moon. Next slide. And last but not least, most importantly, my connection to this movie is that the main characters portrayed in the film, Osi and Nirmala Abraham, are actually my uncle and my auntie. Uh, uncle Osi is my mom's cousin. Uh, they live in Delaware, and I remember visiting with them many times when I was a child. The photo on the left, that's me with them after the film screening at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. And the photo on the right, that's Uncle Osi, and that's uh, a photo in my parents' front yard in Manassas, Virginia, a long time ago. That's Uncle Osi and Nirmala Auntie on the right, and on the left, that's my grandfather and my grandmother in their one and only visit to the United States not long after me and my twin brother were born. The cool thing is I didn't even know about this connection until a week before I saw the film. For some people to find out about a, a newly find out about an awesome familial connection, that is a unique and unexpected surprise. But if you come from a South Indian family like mine, we call that Monday. <laughs> All this to say, my connection to the mission of NASA is not just debits and credits. It runs all the way back to one small visit before the moon landing. And with that, let's get started with our magic words. Next slide. So all the magic words I'm going to offer today could be considered my simple implementation of a famous Maya Angelou quote in which she said, I have learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So the first words I use often, especially in smaller groups. Hi, Nick. I was hoping I could get your thoughts on something I am working on. I understand there's a lot of different people in offices uh, in this room, and so it's hard for me to give one-size-fits-all advice but I think it's okay for me to say, never start your talk or your presentation with what's on the bottom of your Bob J report. <laughs> Essentially, if you can genuinely express to someone how important and valuable they are to you and your work, they are more likely to be those things for you. So let's break down these words a little bit. In the start, if there is a person or persons that you know you're going to be asking help from, acknowledge them by name. What if you've already acknowledged them by name every day before? Do it again. Uh, according to Dale Carnegie in his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, he says, a person's name is to that person the sweetest, most important sound in any language. Nick, how did you like me saying your name? Good. It was good. He said it was good. Yeah. The purpose of meetings and all communications, or let me, let me talk about the second part. I was hoping I could get your thoughts. The purpose of meetings and all communications is to share information and knowledge amongst each other. And so the person you're working with will, pr will probably feel a little bit better about themselves if you acknowledge them as a person that you need info from. At least that's how it works for me. And that will hopefully make them intrinsically more invested in the results you're working on. I've probably said these words 100 times. I've probably gotten 100 good responses. I'm not a great accountant, but my rough math says that's 100% success rate. <laughs> you often see in large organizations uh, people hiding behind hierarchy of org charts to get what they want. And I think acknowledging people as humans gets you 100 times, maybe 1,000 times further in the long run. So I've worked at NASA since 2009. That's your cue to tell your neighbor he must have started when he was a child. That was before we got a clean audit opinion every year. And I, I don't think I have ever been a part of a work issue so urgent and dire that we did not have enough time to start things off in a personal and a friendly manner. So how does this apply to me? When I think of anything good I've done here at NASA, I think of one person. This is going to be random. Kaiser Soze. Does anybody know who Kaiser Soze is? I got a couple of people here. OK, I got a couple of people here. Yes. He was the main fictional character in the movie The Usual Suspects. But he was actually a, part, a, a little part of this person's thoughts, and a part of that person's thoughts, and a part of this person's imagination. And when I think about being good at your job and being good at my job, I think of being like Kaiser Soze. I want to gain the best knowledge from Gene. I want to gain the best knowledge from Lita. I want to get, gain the best idea from Kimberly. 
That's what I want to emulate. I just, I, and I think the best way to start on the path of this is with these magic words. So before we move on to the next one, let's say this out loud together on the count of three. One, two, three. Hey, Nick, I was hoping I could get your thoughts on something I am working on. Nick, you're going to have a lot of people to talk to next week. <laughs> next slide. Spoiler alert. I like to write, and I think that goes with speaking. It's hard to speak well in front of others if you didn't write it down first. And if I'm trying to get a consensus on a solution for an accounting problem, which, used to, which for a lot of my career was a lot of my job, I think putting things in writing is often the best medium for that. And I think in the past I used to get a little bit carried away with this. And I once had a manager at NASA tell me directly, John, nobody's going to read past the first page. And I appreciated that direct and brutally honest feedback. And that got me to think that most people who attend your meeting or listen to your talk uh, don't, will not absorb 90% of what you said. And the more important you think you are, I think the more true that statement will be. And uh, I think that's OK. That's just all part of being a human. But how do we account for this better? Just like I was here at last year's forum, I talked for an hour. In the old, and I thought everybody would remember my tagline, and uh, we had a couple people. And again, that's OK. So with that in mind, how do we account this better? There's an acronym I have seen called BLUF, B-L-U-F. Does anybody know what that acronym stands for? Vicky. Bottom line up front. Bottom line up front. This derives from Army regulations, which is cited as follows. Army writing will be concise, organized, and to the point. Two essential requirements include putting the main point in the beginning of the correspondence, bottom line up front, and using the active voice. So here's how I would apply this. When you start a meeting, after introducing yourself, let them know what you are going to say or ask for at the end. It's not a movie. You can spoil the ending, especially if there's an action as a result of your meeting or especially if you're talking to someone in upper management or anyone who has limited time and limited mental bandwidth. I personally often use the phrase spoiler alert before stating this. So some examples of this could be spoiler alert, OMB is requiring NASA to close this treasury account symbol so each center is going to have an action to clear their balances before year end. In this case, this is good. They know there's an action coming to them, and they will pay attention accordingly when they hear the action assigned to their center. Or I can say at the beginning, spoiler alert, there will, this is an informative presentation. There will be no action items at the result of today's meeting. Also good. It lets people uh, mentally decide how much they want to be engaged. Or another example, spoiler alert, Bruce Willis's character was dead the whole time. <laughs> I say this one because somebody spoiled the ending of The Sixth Sense to me before I watched it. And although I was not happy about what happened, let me tell you, I followed that movie very closely. <laughs> I just told you the ending of two movies in five minutes, The Usual Suspects and The Sixth Sense. You had 20 years to watch them both. You're welcome. <laughs> By a show of hands, who's ever been in a meeting and 30 minutes in said to yourself, what is this meeting about? OK, now with your hand up, point to the person who hosted that meeting. <laughs> oh, man. Are some of you pointing at me? OK, let me rephrase that question. Who has ever hosted a meeting in 30 minutes in felt like you did not get the response or feedback that you wanted? That is also us, right? That is all of us, too. We are the problems. We are also the solutions. So spoiler alert. A good way to keep people engaged is to tell them the bottom line up front. Next slide. I think most of us are familiar, but just in case, I thought I would give a quick background on the subject before we jump in. I think something we should always think about before making a presentation, does everyone who needs to hear this know what they need to know before they hear this? And if the answer is no, it's going to, get, it's going to be hard to get much value in what you say unless you're able to catch them up to an appropriate level. So for example, some TV shows, like sitcoms, you can watch any episode from any season, and you're good. I think Gilligan's Island. You can enjoy watching the skipper and Gilligan argue over whether they're going to have coconuts or papayas for breakfast without knowing how they ruined the professor's transmitter in the prior season. But some shows, you have to watch season one before seeing season two. Otherwise, you don't know why everyone around Walter White is getting murdered. 
And unfortunately, I think a lot of our work is more of the latter. And this thought came to mind not as a presenter, but as an attendee of a lot of meetings and conferences. Sometimes I have to attend a meeting because I'm acting for somebody. And if nobody gives me a background or a recap, then I am pretty much useless to be able to understand what's being said and pass on any information to somebody else. I've also had times where I'm, I'm in a meeting, I don't know what's being said, and then 20 minutes in, I hear something that sounds familiar. And then I message my coworker, Jessica, and I say, hey, are they talking about the same XYZ topic that we were talking about last month? And the minute she affirms that I, I got it correctly, then all of a sudden I feel like, okay, I actually knew more than I thought. I think I'm all caught up. But I think to myself, wouldn't it have been nicer if I was all caught up when this meeting started so I could have been engaged for the last 20 minutes? So for a practical example, as the one trying to give a background, a couple years ago, I spent a lot of time on a, on a project updating some posting logic and how we report some things for Treasury. And I understood that this may have been more important for people like me at headquarters than the people that I was presenting it to. So every time I gave an update at a process champion meeting, I made sure to explain and we explained the basics of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Why? Because if you didn't even know what this is, why does it matter to you that I'm even changing something? So when I'm giving a presentation on a particular issue, this is the phrase that I often will give to, to give everyone as much background knowledge as I think I have enough time to give. Here it is. I think most of us are familiar, but just in case, I thought I would give a quick background on the subject before we jump in. Here's why I came up with this. I will never ask my audience if they need a background, and I suggest you not do the same either. It's just awkward for everybody because a lot of people don't want to raise their hand and speak up and say, I don't know. So for example, I don't think it's helpful for me to start a meeting and say, does anybody here not know how depreciation and amortization work and need me to explain it to you again? Most people, even if they need to know, are not going to raise their hand and say, no, I don't know. And phrasing it that way can come across as talking down to people around you. Nobody knows everything. That's OK. And that's the purpose of why we bring people together to talk about these things. I specifically use the words I think most of us are familiar, whether I think that statement is true or not, because I think it gives the optics of positive presumption that everyone here is knowledgeable, and the words, but just in case I thought I would give a quick background, shows that I'm going to be the one to take a little more initiative to be just a little bit more helpful. I see this missing in meetings occasionally. We have meetings with people from different offices, different levels of knowledge. The presenter jumps right into the Bob J. Budget Report. And a lot of the initial discussion is people sometimes just catching, them, uh, catching themselves up on what's being said, or even worse, just not paying attention at all. So I think a phrase like this gives you, the presenter, the ability to take the initiative to offer this on yourself and make the subsequent conversations go a lot smoother. It gives good optics of helpfulness. It will make the rest of your conversations be more productive. So before we move on to the next one, let's say, all say this out loud together. Ready? Let's go. I think most of us are familiar, but just in case, I thought I would give a quick background of the subject before we jump in. Doing great. Next slide. A quick recap on this one for those who missed or for those who forgot, because like I acknowledged, we don't remember 90% of what we heard after subsequent time. Thanks for the question. Let me tell you what I know. I mentioned before, I teach a class on professional speaking for CFO University. And a question I always get when I teach my class, which I think relates to people who struggle with fear, nervousness, and anxiety, is what if I get a tough question at the end that I don't know the answer to? And I think this question makes a lot of sense. A lot of people feel like they can prepare for everything they're going to say, but they're worried that somebody else will ask a question that wasn't what they prepared for. I also once had someone ask me, I don't, if I don't know the answer, can I just make something up? <laughs> and I said, no, don't do that. Uh, but, it, but when this person elaborated, it was actually a very genuine and thoughtful question because that was this person's impression of other people when faced in that particular situation. 
So I thought I would give you, and again, these are all good, practical, and valid questions uh, that we should talk about in order to do our jobs better. And so I thought I would give you this quick practical tip on how I handle these situations. If I get a question which I can't fully answer, which is gonna happen, the more you work, the more you lead, the more you're gonna be responsible for things that are only tangentially related to what you thought you were gonna be working on. So if I get a question I don't know the answer to, I don't panic, I don't worry, I try to respond with the phrase, thanks for the question, let me tell you what I know. So for example, if a question comes up that probably better applies to another office, I don't respond with, talk to procurement. I start with, thanks for the question, let me tell you what I know, and hopefully offer something helpful based on what I know, because I do know some helpful things. I was just the one giving the presentation, and I eventually may close with, but if we want to know more details about that, we may have to go have a conversation with the Office of Procurement. Notice I said we, implying that I am even willing to help you reach out to the right person. Or maybe I get a question that does apply to my office or my work, I just don't know the answer right now. I use the same words, but end with, but if we want to know the details of this process, let me do some research and get back with you. Or, let me talk to my colleagues and get back to you. There is nothing wrong with saying something on those lines, presuming that you're planning on getting back to them. And I think this phrase accomplishes a couple things. One, you don't have to say, I don't know, because saying I don't know and ending your sentence right there uh, doesn't give good optics of helpfulness. Um, and saying, let me tell you what I know, gives a good faith gesture of meeting somebody halfway. And more often than not, when I tell somebody what I know, that is enough to answer that person's question, and we typically don't have to take it much further than that. So I think about that as a win-win for everybody. Ultimately, giving the optics of wanting to go a little bit extra just to be genuinely helpful will take you much further than you probably think. So before we conclude, let's say all this out loud together. Ready? Thanks for the question. Let me tell you what I know. All right. Next year when I ask what was the last slide, we're all going to get it. Okay? Next slide. Well, those were my magic words that I wanted to share with you today. Notice what words did not make the list. Sorry, I was on mute, not magic words. <laughs> hey, you're on mute, not magic words. I'm giving you five minutes back. Never say that to me again. <laughs> Many years ago, my friend at Kennedy Space Center, Lisa Langham, said to me, John, you remind me of a speaker named Jay Shetty. And I did what people often do when they're compared to somebody they don't know, which is they nervously Google who they're being compared to. <laughs> and I was very flattered by the comparison. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be bringing it up to you again right now. And I read his book called Think Like a Monk, Think Like a Monk. And I talk about ideas from his book often, probably just so I can low-key brag that somebody thought I was like this person. <laughs> and my final thoughts for you today are best summarized by a quote I read in this book. Plant trees under shade you do not plant to sit. Let me say that again. Plant trees under whose shade you do not plant to sit. This was in the heading of a chapter that explained that what the author learned most from his short time from being a monk is that the highest purpose in life is service. And that made me think, what do they call most of us as our job? Service. Civil servants, right? that is built into our job. And even if you're not a civil servant, we all have the same nature of our jobs. The purpose of our job is to serve the public. And for those of, for those of us who don't necessarily face the public, which is most of us, it's easy to forget that. And sometimes a good way we can serve the public is simply to serve each other. I may otherwise rephrase this quote for us as, just be helpful, or maybe expand on that a little more. Just be a little more helpful than you have to be. I'll say that one last time. Just be a little more helpful than you have to be. Than you have to be. Everything I offer today will probably only work to the best extent if you genuinely want to be helpful to those around you. So next time you think about speaking or presenting, about finance or budget or anything else to your colleagues, just simply think about trying to be just a little more helpful than you have to be. Borrow some of these magic words I shared with you today. And I think if we can all do that, I think we as NASA OCFO can be just a little bit better or maybe a lot better as an organization uh, together. Well, that's my talk. 
Thank you, Joe, for letting me do this again. Thank you all for listening to my stories. I'm always, I, I consider myself a very approachable person. I'm always available on Microsoft Teams if anybody wants to talk to me about something I talked about here or anything else. Uh, thanks again, as always, for listening. As always, if you enjoyed the show, my name is John Mathai. If not, I'm Frankie Peterson. Thank you. <laughs>